Catherine Holiday, also known as Kate, and it's February 5th, the Wednesday in 2020. Wonderful. So today I'm talking with Catherine Kate Holiday, who's named after um, one of my favorite actresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kate, as I know her, is a colleague at um, the College of Architecture and Planning and Public Affairs at University of Texas Arlington. And um, she's also an architectural historian, and we're really lucky because she's cross-disciplinary. She teaches in both architecture and landscape architecture. So our topic is about working in the African-American community, um, and I want to talk to Kate about this because this seems to be one of the things, well, it is, doesn't seem to be. It's one of the things she's doing. I want to ask her, as an architectural historian, how do you frame that kind of um, discipline within this work in the community? And what kind of work are you doing? And what communities are you working in? Okay, so so I think there are a couple ways of answering that. And I think the first one has to do with architectural history as a, as a big discipline. Um, and I'm lucky to be working as an architectural historian at a time when there are a lot of really wonderful scholars doing great work about the relationship of race and architecture, and especially for me as someone who specializes in American architecture and American cities, particular to the way that discourses about race, policy about race, uh, and the way that the profession has evolved around a self-definition that is essentially male and white. Um, scholars are really investigating those questions um, and why why the profession has, has evolved the way that, that it has. Um, and so I have the enormous benefit of work from people like Mabel Wilson at Columbia and Diane Harris, um, the recent kind of reassessment of someone like Thomas Jefferson um, as, as someone who is not necessarily this kind of ideal gentleman architect, but in fact someone who is a slave owner, and, and suggesting that it, we need to hold ourselves accountable for being more honest in assessing the work of our kind of heroic figures from architectural history. Um, or in the case of Diane Harris's book on little white houses, you know, even in a case where in the white suburbs of the post-war America, it seems like race is not a, really the, a present issue because the suburbs that she's looking at in that book are all white. In fact, race is an issue uh, because of the way that those places were designed for whiteness. Um, and I, I think the kind of work that, that they've done and that many, many other scholars have, have done in architectural history has really provided a model for the rest of us um, and also an inspiration to hold ourselves uh, to a different kind of standard about how we deal with race um, in our own work. Um, the kind of second academic answer to that question has to do with historic preservation. Um, and historic preservation from its beginnings really was associated with the, these groups of elite women um, who were all white going out and advocating for places like Mount Vernon or the Alamo um, and taking a series of landmarks and, and setting them aside as, as monuments of our of a kind of um, main line of American history. Uh, but historic preservation across the past generation has also really tried to hold itself to a different kind of standard about equity and the way that other kinds of places and landscapes and communities and neighborhoods and other kinds of architectures are included as important places. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's been done in historic preservation um, to try to understand the ways that vernacular landscapes, the ways that African-American communities, Latino communities, um, immigrant communities have defined themselves through design and architecture. Um, and that has also had a big influence on me um, in the way that I think about which communities need advocacy for historic preservation purposes. Um, so to get to the last part of the question, <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, it, there are a number, there's so many communities in Dallas-Fort Worth um, that could use design support, uh, the support of a historian, a historic preservation expert in trying to achieve their goals um, in receiving greater recognition for their stories, receiving historic preservation protection if they want it. Um, certainly in almost all cases, having a greater degree of authority um, in coming to the table about what they want to see happen in their communities. And there's only this one architecture school, um, which is traditionally one of the one of the ways that the profession has been able to reach out to underserved communities is through academics. 
Um, and we've only got one architecture school and there's a lot of amazing work to be done here. Um, so the place in Dallas, Fort Worth. in Dallas, Fort Worth, absolutely. Um, and so the, the community that I'm focusing on right now, um, is a community of Joppy in South Dallas. Um, this is a community that traces its roots, um, uh, back to a Freedman's town that was established, um, in the late 19th century. Um, and that is a small, well-defined community that's actually under a huge amount of development pressure from many different angles. Cement bashing plant on one side, railroad on the other, and the Trinity River on another boundary, uh, which is undergoing a lot of recreational development. Um, and it's a neighborhood that uh, would like to be at the table um, for conversations about its future. It's a neighborhood that Habitat for Humanity has had a huge impact on, which has built more than 100 houses in this incredibly small community over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, and so it's seen its landscape altered um, in, in many, many different ways. Um, and my involvement really came um, as I was kind of working on a symposium, uh, the Dillard Symposium in 2017. And I was reaching out to a number of, of nonprofits to learn more about the work that they do um, in various communities in Dallas. And I had a tour uh, from a woman at Habitat for Humanity who was just taking me to places that Habitat works to see their impact. And as we were driving through Joppy, she kind of pointed out this small little red brick building and said, oh yeah, and we just, we just got this building and it's land and, you know, it's in terrible shape. You know, it's the old school. We really want to tear it down and build, build something. And I said, what? Um, and I think this is this is the benefit that a that a historic preservationist or an architectural historian can bring to these kind of projects is is the ability to say no that fits into a larger national conversation that's happening about historic schools in historically African American communities. It's not a dilapidated building in a in a neighborhood on the perimeter of Dallas. In fact, it's a, it's an example of something incredibly important to the national conversation about architecture, race, Freedman's towns. Um, and, and a lot of other, other things. Um, since then, I, I've tried to advocate with Habitat not to tear the building down, but to actually do some research and, and try to advocate for preserving the building and turning it into something that the community has a stake in um, and has a say in how that building will be used rather than tearing it down. There are graduates of the school, um, obviously, who are still around. Um, there are graduates of the school who live in the community. Um, and there's, there's just a huge opportunity there if the building is is suited for adaptive reuse, which I pretty much think it is, um, to become something other than something that's gone. It's great. There are like real physical implications. <laughs> to yeah, the, and the it's not just a have. small little red brick building. It's actually important. It's really important. Um, and so to just be able to support a community that wants to save a building um, is uh it's important for an architecture historian to translate the work I do into something that matters to the community. So um, just to go back a bit before I ask my next question, um, you talked about history and I always, um, so two things, like I get um, questions often about, you know, do you have to be of the same race to work in the community? You know, do I have to be black to work in the black community? And I get those questions a lot because I always talk about how you have to have some connection to the community, community and some um, real understanding of history and culture because I think that history and culture is really key to how people live and use space. So um, um, as a historian, I guess you, you kind of really understand that. And, you know, I, I bet you, I don't know if you do, but often I get pushed back, like, especially with yeah. designers, like, why do I need to understand the history? I'm going to go in and have my engagement. I'm like, no, because history, you know, it's about who people are and, you know, how they live or lived and how they live now. And, yeah. you, need, and you need that information. And I always say history is storytelling, right? And, and uh, you know, design is also a kind of storytelling and if you're doing using design as storytelling without the history piece, then you're not telling a full story. Um, I, I also, you know, the thing that's interesting about history too is, um, as a historian, it's one of the things that everybody feels like they're a historian, and we all are because we're all storytellers. Mm -hmm. But there are different kinds of history, right? Um, and the kind of history 
that I can offer is the kind that requires you to go into the archives and into the city surveyor's office and especially in terms of historic preservation understand what kinds of documentation you have to provide and, and you know there are these kind of technical um, professional parts of being a historian that I think sometimes aren't necessarily ap appreciated and I don't say that to say well I'm a I'm a historian I'm on this pedestal it's more that you know we're all historians but there but there are different types and we need different kinds at different moments do you um, ever use oral histories or histories from yes and oral history is another kind of history that's incredibly important and sometimes that kind of professional history will conflict with an oral history and how you navigate people's memories and stories as fundamentally important to how we understand meaning of place versus say I go to the surveyor's office and I find this information right the, sometimes those things kind of conflict with each other um, being aware of that uh, trying to find ways to, to work through that uh, is really important to public history um, and the ways that you use kind of academic tools to serve a public purpose um, it can be that can be difficult but there's you know there's academic history there's oral history there, there are kind of family histories that we tell to each other um, there's just a lot of different kinds of history and we're in it every day so as you mentioned you are not African-American <laughs> so um, and um, there are probably lots of other histories or communities you could look at so I want to know why you chose these particular communities and then um, how, and I can say this just because I've actually been with you. <laughs> and so how do you get such acceptance and trust that you, you have? So I, that's, a, I think, a really good question because I, I, um, I don't know, right? If it were a formula, I think we would bottle it and hand it out to everyone yes. so that we could all be more trusting of each other. <laughs> uh, I, I think that listening is important. So even though I'm talking right now, Listening is really important to me. Um, and because I do really believe history is stories, um, I tell stories in a particular way, but I need to listen to other people's stories. And I, and I take it really seriously. I like listening to people's stories. And I, I think people can, that's, that's one thing, is I really do enjoy listening. Um, I also think that, you know, kind of related to the, this larger idea, you know, I, I we all have a capacity probably for, for empathy on some level. Um, but I also, as a woman working in an architecture school, um, where I'm the only woman to ever tenure in the 50 year history of the school, that wow. was an incredibly difficult experience. Um, and I can only imagine what it would be like if I weren't a white woman. Um, and I think after gaining tenure, that perspective on how hard that was for me, and then thinking about how hard that must be for people who have add other kinds of differences, right? For African-American women, for Latino women, right? Like you add differences um, and it gets even harder. And it's incredibly important to me to create even just a working environment that's more open and accessible to greater um, diversity of, of people. Um, and, I, and I think in a way that's why I try to hold myself more accountable in my teaching and in the research that I do, um, that if I want my story to be important, then then everyone's story has has to be important. And I and that's not just a it's not a ruse. I actually really I believe that, um, and I think that that honesty is a part of a part of being able to at least do some of the work. I also try very carefully not to overpromise because I can't fix I can't really fix anything in a community like Joppy, but I can certainly help advocate and provide tools. Um, so that in the areas where I do have some expertise, I can just support um, ongoing efforts. Great. So that actually leads directly into the next question. Um, so how um, how do you think those in you know the professions that deal with the built environment and communities, um, how can we like have these conversations and be open and honest? I, it's a really hard thing. There, so you have to create spaces for them to happen. And I think the symposium that we did um, this year, which you very, very gracefully stepped in as a moderator, um, the kind of conversation we had at 2019 Dilla Symposium at the African American Museum very much highlighted the voices of community advocates. Um, and I was only sad that there weren't 
more designers in the room listening. Um, and I do think, you know, architecture, landscape architecture and planning, these are businesses. Um, and there's not always something built into the business plan for listening. <laughs> um, but I think that that's, that experience listening uh, is incredibly important. And if I could advocate for anything, it would be for more, more of that kind of listening. Um, even as a historian, talking to designers, um, a, a lot of times designers feel like they know the history and, and there's just, there's a lot more to know, right? And so it is about this kind of give and take. Um, but I do understand the business pressure of design and that sometimes you just have to turn, you have to turn something out, right? You have to make a decision. Um, but there's definitely more need for breathing room. Um, but I'm also curious on your perspective on this too, right? Because as a, as a white architectural historian, um, I, I think that one of the things that's been important for me is to advocate for me not to be the, the person that has has to be the only one who talks about um, history of African-American or Latino architecture. And it needs to become much more integrated into the way that we have conversations about which places matter to us. And what are, what are your thoughts about how, how historians or designers should be doing that also? Well, I do agree with you. It's about listening. And it's actually, I think, about being um, more kind of transactive, like as a designer, when you go into a place, knowing that, yes, you have something to give your technical expertise, but so does the community, which is often their story and knowledge of place, you know, because it is their place. And I think that um, designers, because we do, you know, it's business, it's competitive, even, even both in academia is very competitive and private practice. <laughs> it's both it's competitive yeah. so I think you're right it's hard sometimes to put that down and to realize that you're not competing with these people <laughs> or even when you're like having this conversation with other often it's hard for us to talk to each other because we're always in that kind of competitive mode yeah you know I did this and you did you know as opposed to like you said just trying to listen to each other and being you know vulnerable willing to you know to learn that you've done something wrong or yes. you have the wrong right wrong approach or you you know it's really hard for us <laughs> it is it is and and I think that's that's important to me too is to be able to I, I would much rather someone tell me that is 100% wrong you'd never do that again than to just blithely go around ignorant um, I would much 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 rather have someone tell me don't don't do that and I also think that um, this kind of work if we you know it's been proven. I mean, this, this kind of work where you really become in tune to the place and the people that you're working with, I won't say for, but with, um, they tend to be more resilient, right? I mean, the communities tend to take care of them more. Um, they tend to appreciate the work. They have a longer life and they have more meaning. Yeah, and I think that, you know, academic work, you know, teaching in a university, you have to pursue scholarly research, right? And you have to disseminate that amongst your peers in this kind of scholarly academic way. And that, that's important to me. But translating that into something that's meaningful to people who really don't care uh, about my last journal article. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just has a different kind of life and meaning. Um, I, I didn't start off to be an academic. I started off wanting to work in a museum, and museums have a public programming mission. Um, and so I think that that's part of part of why this has become a part of what I try to do um, as an academic at, at some scale, just because that is that's what you know public storytelling is. You know what? How do we think about history, especially in a moment when our history is so contested? Um, trying to be truthful and create. Uh, language and knowledge that allows people to acknowledge that the history of this country is not one, a march towards, you know, this grand democracy, right? We have We're a huge marching, number of <laughs> a huge number of roadblocks, right? Yes. Um, so not to over idealize, um, and to be honest about about where where American architecture um, lies in that bigger conversation. Yeah. So the last thing I want to ask you to wrap up is. Um, Tell us about what you're doing now. But I want to know about something that you're doing now that you're really excited about. 
really excited about that. That's an incredibly hard question. Um, so I actually think um, that this, this school project is actually very exciting to me. Um, the idea that a kind of small nucleus uh, that's kind of off the map could potentially, you know, my fingers are crossed, become a catalyst um, for a community um, and Austin probably has more to say about this too, could become a catalyst for a community to work through issues that have divided them in the past. It could become a catalyst for a nonprofit that has a, you know, a really terrific positive mission, um, but that maybe hasn't thought about the implications of what it means to build 100 houses in a small neighborhood, for them to kind of think about what it means to actually be rebuilding a whole community instead of just some individual houses. Um, and if it could be a catalyst also to bring greater recognition to kind of the, the story of civil rights in Dallas uh, and the role historic preservation can play in helping tell that story, which is very different than in other southern cities, um, I think that would just be amazing. Uh, yes, so it's, it's a pretty exciting. exciting. It's exciting, right? If you yeah. get it to work on, on as a story on all of those levels, I think it would be very exciting. So my fingers are crossed. So are you going to have students involved in this? Yes. So I've had students working with me, um, assembling the documentation. I think the, the project at this point is really in the hands um, of an architect who needs to go in and assess the building and, and just figure out. And it, it is in bad shape. Um, it's been empty for a while. Um, and once that happens, um, there's a need to go in and, and do a greater degree of engagement and talk to people about um, what they'd like to see in the building. Um, I know that uh, Habitat, as the owner of the building, um, has said that they are interested in the idea of um, an exhibit on community history. And so there's a huge opportunity to actually bring in uh, oral histories, uh, any kind of family documents that people want to share, right, to kind of create a narrative of their own community with their own stories. Okay, great. Thank you, Kate. This was Kate Holliday, Associate Professor in the School of Architecture at University of Texas in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you, Diane.